Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari Lives of Benvenuto Garofalo and Girolamo da Carpi, Painters of Ferrara and of Other Lombards In this part of the lives that we are about to write, we shall give a brief account of the best and most eminent painters, sculptors, and architects who have lived in Lombardy in our time, after Mantegna, Costa, Boccaccino of Cremona, and Francia of Bologna. For I am not able to write the life of each in detail, and it seems to me enough to enumerate their works. And even this I would not have set myself to do, nor to give a judgment on those works, if I had not first seen them. But since, from the year 1542 down to this present year of 1566, I had not traveled, as I did before, over almost the whole of Italy, nor seen the above-mentioned works and the others that had appeared in great numbers during that period of four and twenty years, I resolved, before writing of them, being almost at the end of this my labor, to see them and judge of them with my own eyes. Wherefore, after the conclusion of the above-mentioned nuptials of the most illustrious Lord Don Francesco de' Medici, Prince of Florence, and Siena, my master, and of Her Serene Highness Queen Joanna of Austria, on account of which I had been much occupied for two years on the ceiling of the principal hall of their palace, I resolved, without sparing any expense or fatigue, to revisit Rome, Tuscany, part of the March, Umbria, Romagna, Lombardy, and Venice, with all her domain, in order to re-examine the old works, and to see the many that have been executed from the year 1542 onward. And so, having made a record of the works that were most notable and most worthy to be put down in writing, in order not to do wrong to the talents of many craftsmen, or depart from that sincere truthfulness which is expected from those who write history of any kind, I shall proceed without bias of mind to write down all that is wanting in any part of what has been already written without disturbing the order of the story, and then to give an account of the works of some who are still living, and have worked, or are still working excellently well, for it appears to me that so much is demanded by the merits of many rare and noble craftsmen. Let me begin, then, with the men of Ferrara. Benvenuto Garofalo was born at Ferrara in the year 1481 to Piero Tisi, whose elders had their origin in Padua. He was born, I say, so inclined to painting, that when still but a little boy, while going to school to learn reading, he would do nothing but draw from which exercise his father, who looked on painting as a folly, sought to divert him, but was never able. Wherefore that father, having seen that he must second the inclination of that son of his, who would never do anything day and night but draw, finally placed him with Domenico Panetti, a painter of some repute at that time, although his manner was dry and labored in Ferrara. With that Domenico Benvenuto had been some little time, when, going once to Cremona, he happened to see in the principal chapel of the Duomo in that city, among other works by the hand of Boccaccio Boccaccino, a painter of Cremona, who had painted the tribune there in fresco, a Christ seated on a throne surrounded by four saints and giving the benediction. Whereupon, that work having pleased him, he placed himself by means of some friends under Boccaccino, who was at that time executing in the same church, likewise in fresco, some stories of the Madonna, as has been said in his life, in competition with the painter Altobello, who was painting in the same church opposite to Boccaccino some stories of Jesus Christ, which are very beautiful and truly worthy to be praised. 
Now, after Benvenuto had been two years in Cremona, and had made much progress under the discipline of Boccaccino, he went off in the year 1500, at the age of nineteen, to Rome, where, having placed himself with Giovanni Baldini, a Florentine painter of passing good skill, who possessed many very beautiful drawings by various excellent masters, he was constantly practicing his hand on those drawings whenever he had time, and particularly at night. Then, after he had been fifteen months with that master, and had seen, to his great delight, the works of Rome, he traveled for a time over various parts of Italy, and finally made his way to Mantua. There he stayed two years with the painter Lorenzo Costa, serving him with such lovingness that Lorenzo, after that period of two years, in order to reward him, placed him in the service of Francesco Gonzaga, Marquis of Mantua, for whom Costa himself was working. But Benvenuto had not been long with the Marquis when, his father Piero falling ill in Ferrara, he was forced to return to that city, where he stayed afterwards for four years together, executing many works by himself alone, and some in company with the Dossi. Then, in the year 1505, being sent for by Messer Geronimo Sagrato, a gentleman of Ferrara who was living in Rome, Benvenuto returned there with the greatest willingness and particularly from a desire to see the miracles that were being related of Raffaello da Urbino and of the Chapel of Julius painted by Buonarti. But when Benvenuto had arrived in Rome, he was struck with amazement and almost with despair by seeing the grace and vivacity that the pictures of Raffaello revealed and the depth in the design of Michelagnolo. Wherefore he cursed the manners of Lombardy, and that which he had learned with so much study and effort at Mantua, and right willingly, if he had been able, would he have purged himself of all that knowledge. But he resolved, since there was no help for it, that he would unlearn it all, and after the loss of so many years, change from a master into a disciple and so he began to draw from such works as were the best and the most difficult, and to study with all possible diligence those greatly celebrated manners, and gave his attention to scarcely any other thing for a period of two whole years, by reason of which he so changed his method, transforming his bad manner into a good one, that notice was taken of him by the craftsman. And what was more, he so went to work with humility and every kind of loving service, that he became the friend of Raffaello da Urbino, who, being very courteous and not ungrateful, taught Benvenuto many things, and always assisted and favored him. If Benvenuto had pursued his studies in Rome, without a doubt he would have done things worthy of his beautiful genius, but he was constrained, I know not by what cause, to return to his own country. In taking leave of Raffaello, he promised that he would, as that master advised him, return to Rome, where Raffaello assured him that he would give him more than enough in the way of work, and that in honorable undertakings. Having then arrived in Ferrara, Benvenuto settled the affairs, and dispatched the business that had caused him to return, and he was preparing himself to make his way back to Rome, when the Lord Duke Alfonso of Ferrara set him to decorate a little chapel in the castle, in company with other Ferrarese painters. That work finished, his departure was again delayed by the great courtesy of Messer Antonio Castabili, a Ferrarese gentleman of much authority, who gave him an altarpiece to paint in oils for the high altar of the church of Sant'Andrea, which finished, he was forced to execute another for San Bartolo, a convent of Cistercian monks, 
wherein he painted the adoration of the Magi, which was beautiful and much extolled. He then painted another for the Duomo, full of figures many and various, and two others that were placed in the church of San Spirito, in one of which is the Virgin in the air, with the child in her arms, and some figures below, and in the other the Nativity of Jesus Christ. In executing those works, remembering at times how he had turned his back on Rome, he felt the bitterest regret, and he had resolved at all costs to return thither, when, his father Piero's death taking place, all his plans were broken off, for, finding himself burdened with a sister ready for a husband, and a brother fourteen years of age, and his affairs in disorder, he was forced to compose his mind, and resign himself to live in his native place. And so, after parting company with the Dossi, who had worked with him up to that time, he painted by himself in the church of San Francesco, in a little chapel, the raising of Lazarus, a work filled with a variety of good figures, and pleasant in coloring, with attitudes spirited and vivacious, which brought him much commendation. In another chapel in the same church, he painted the massacre of the innocents, cruelly done to death by Herod so well and with such spirited movements in the soldiers and other figures that it was a marvel. Very well depicted, in addition, are different expressions in the great variety of heads, such as terror in the mothers and nurses, death in the infants, and cruelty in the slayers, and many other things which gave infinite satisfaction. It is worthy of remark that in executing that work, Benvenuto did a thing that up to that time had never been done in Lombardy. Namely, he made models of clay, the better to see the shadows and lights, and availed himself of a figure model made of wood, jointed in such a way that the limbs moved in every direction, which he arranged as he wished, in various attitudes with draperies over it, but what is most important is that he copied every least detail from life and nature, as one who knew that the true way is to observe and imitate the reality. For the same church he executed the altarpiece of a chapel, and on a wall he painted in fresco Christ taken by the multitude in the garden. For San Domenico in the same city, he painted two altar pieces in oils. In one is the miracle of the cross and St. Helen, and in the other is St. Peter, martyr, with a good number of very beautiful figures, wherein it is evident that Benvenuto departed considerably from his first manner, making it bolder and less labored. For the nuns of San Silvestro, he painted an altar picture of Christ praying to his Father on the mount, while the three apostles are lower down, sleeping. For the nuns of San Gabriello, he executed an Annunciation, and for those of San Antonio, in the altarpiece of their high altar, the resurrection of Christ. For the high altar of the Frati in Gesuati, in the church of San Girolamo, he painted Jesus Christ in the manger, with a choir of angels on a cloud, held to be very beautiful. In Santa Maria del Vado, in an altarpiece by the same hand, very well conceived and colored, is Christ ascending into heaven, with the apostles standing in contemplation of him. For the church of San Giorgio, a seat of the monks of Monte Eleveto, without the city, he painted an altarpiece in oils of the Magi adoring Christ, and offering to him myrrh, incense, and gold, and this is one of the best works that Benvenuto ever executed in all his life. 
All these works much pleased the people of Ferrara, by reason of which he executed pictures almost without number for their houses, and many others for monasteries, and for the townships and villas round about the city. And among others he painted the resurrection of Christ in an altarpiece for Bandino. And finally he executed in fresco with beautiful and fantastic invention in the refectory of Sant'Andrea many figures that are bringing the Old Testament into accord with the New. But since the works of this master are numberless, let it be enough to have spoken of those that are the best. Girolamo da Carpi, having received his first instructions in painting from Benvenuto, as will be related in his life, they painted in company the façade of the house of the Mozzarelli in the Borgo Nuovo, partly in chiascuro and partly in colors, with some things done in imitation of bronze. They painted together, likewise, both within and without, the Palace of Copara, a place of recreation belonging to the Duke of Ferrara, for which Lord Benvenuto executed many other works, both by himself and in company with other painters. Then, having lived a long time in the determination that he would not take a wife, in the end, after separating from his brother and growing weary of living alone, at the age of forty-eight he took one, but he had scarcely had her a year when, falling grievously ill, he lost the sight of his right eye and was in fear and peril of the other. However, having recommended himself to God and made a vow that he would always dress in grey, as he afterwards did, by the grace of God he preserved the sight of the other eye insomuch that the works executed by him at the age of sixty-five were so well done, and with such diligence and finish, that it was a marvel. Wherefore, on one occasion, when the Duke of Ferrara showed to Pope Paul III a triumph of Bacchus in oils, five brachia in length, and the calumny of Apelles, painted by Benvenuto at that age, after the designs of Raffaello d'Arbino, which pictures are now over certain chimney-pieces belonging to his excellency, that pontiff was struck with astonishment that an old man of such an age with only one eye should have executed works so large and so beautiful. On every feast day for twenty whole years, Benvenuto worked for the love of God in the convent of the nuns of San Bernardino, where he executed many works of importance in oils, in distemper and in fresco, which was certainly a marvelous thing, and a great proof of his true and good nature for in that place he had no competition, and nevertheless put no less study and diligence into his labor than he would have done at any other more frequented place. Those works are passing good in composition, with beautiful expressions in the heads, not confused, and executed in a truly sweet and good manner. For all the disciples that Benvenuto had, although he taught them everything that he knew with no ordinary willingness in order to make some of them excellent masters he never had any success with a single one of them and in place of being rewarded by them for his lovingness at least with gratitude of heart he never received anything from them save vexations wherefore he used to say that he had never had any enemies but his own disciples and assistants in the year fifteen fifty being now old and the malady returning to his eye he became wholly blind and he lived thus for nine years which misfortune he bore with a patient mind resigning himself completely to the will of god Finally, when he had come to the age of seventy-eight, thinking at last that he had lived too long in that darkness and rejoicing in death, in the hope of going to enjoy eternal light, 
he finished the course of his life on the 6th of September, in the year 1559, leaving a son called Girolamo, who was a very gentle person, and a daughter. Benvenuto was a very honest creature, fond of a jest, pleasant in his conversation, patient and calm in all his adversities. As a young man, he delighted in fencing and playing the lute, and in his friendships he was loving beyond measure and prodigal with his services. He was the friend of the painter Giorgione da Castelfranco, Tiziano da Cadore, and Giulio Romano, and most affectionate towards all the men of art in general, and to this I can bear witness, for on the two occasions when I was at Ferrara in his time, I received from him innumerable favors and courtesies. He was buried with honor in the church of Santa Maria del Vado, and was celebrated in verse and prose by many choice spirits no less than his talents deserved. But it has not been possible to obtain Benvenuto's portrait, and therefore there has been placed at the head of these lives of the Lombard painters that of Girolamo de Carpi, whose life we are now about to write. Girolamo, then called de Carpi, who was a Ferrarese and a disciple of Benvenuto, was employed at first by his father Tommaso, who was a kind of house painter in his workshop, to paint strong boxes, stools, mouldings, and other such like commonplace things. After Girolamo had made some proficience under the discipline of Benvenuto, he began to think that he should be removed by his father from those base labors. But Tommaso, as one who had need of money, would do nothing of the kind, and Girolamo resolved at all costs to leave him. And so he went to Bologna, where he received no little favor from the gentlemen of that city, wherefore, having made some portraits, which were passing good likenesses, he acquired so much credit that he earned much money, and assisted his father more while living at Bologna than he had done when staying in Ferrara. At that time there was brought to the house of the noble Counts Ercolani at Bologna a picture by the hand of Antonio da Correggio, in which Christ is appearing to Mary Magdalene in the form of a gardener, executed with incredible softness and excellence, and that manner so took possession of Girolamo's heart that, not content with having copied that picture, he went to Modena to see the other works by the hand of Correggio. Having arrived there, besides being filled with marvel at the sight of them, one among them in particular struck him with amazement and that was the great picture, a divine work, in which is the Madonna, with the child in her arms, marrying St. Catherine, a St. Sebastian, and other figures, with an air of such beauty in the heads that they appear as if made in paradise. Nor is it possible to find more beautiful hair, more lovely hands, or any coloring more pleasing and natural having then received permission to copy it from the owner of the picture, Messer Francesco Grillanzoni, a doctor, who was much the friend of Correggio. Girolamo copied it with the greatest diligence that it is possible to imagine. After that, he did the same with the altar picture of St. Peter Martyr, which Correggio had painted for a company of secular priests, who hold it in very great price, as it deserves, there being in it, in particular, besides other figures, an infant Christ in the lap of his mother, who appears as if breathing, and a most beautiful St. Peter Martyr, and another little altarpiece by the same hand, painted for the company of San Bastiano, and no less beautiful than the other. All these works, thus copied by Girolamo, were the reason that he so improved his manner, that it did not appear like his original manner, or in any way the same thing. 
From Modena, Girolamo went to Parma, where he had heard that there were some works by the same Correggio, and he copied some of the pictures in the Tribune of the Duomo, considering them extraordinary works, particularly the beautiful foreshortening of the Madonna, who is ascending into heaven, surrounded by a multitude of angels, with the apostles who are standing gazing on her as she ascends and four saints, protectors of that city, who are in the niches, St. John the Baptist, who is holding a lamb, St. Joseph, the husband of Our Lady, San Bernardo degli Uberti the Florentine, a cardinal and bishop of Florence, and another bishop. Girolamo likewise studied the figures by the hand of the same Correggio in the recess of the principal chapel in San Giovanni Evangelista, namely the coronation of the Madonna, with St. John the Evangelist, the Baptist, St. Benedict, San Placido, and a multitude of angels who are about them and the marvelous figures that are in the chapel of San Giuseppo in the church of San Sepulcro, a divine example of panel painting. Now, since it is inevitable that those who are pleased to follow some particular manner, and who study it with lovingness, should acquire it, at least in some degree, whence it also happens that many become more excellent than their masters, Girolamo caught not a little of Correggio's manner. Wherefore, after returning to Bologna, he imitated him always, not studying any other thing but that manner, and that altarpiece by the hand of Raffaello d'Urbino, which we mentioned as being in that city. And all these particulars I heard from Girolamo de Carpi, who was much my friend, at Rome in the year 1550 and he lamented very often to me that he had consumed his youth and his best years in Ferrara and Bologna, and not in Rome or some other place where, without a doubt, he would have made much greater proficience. No little harm also did Girolamo suffer in matters of art from his having given too much attention to amorous delights and to playing the lute at the time when he might have been making progress in painting. Having returned then to Bologna, he made a portrait, among others, of Messer Onofrio Bartolini, a Florentine, who was then in that city for his studies, and afterwards became Archbishop of Pisa, and that head, which is now in the possession of the heirs of that Messer Noferi, is very beautiful and in a manner full of grace. There was working in Bologna at this time a certain Maestro Biagio, a painter who, perceiving that Girolamo was coming into good repute, began to be afraid lest he might outstrip him and deprive him of all his profits. Wherefore, seizing a good occasion, he established a friendship with Girolamo with the intention of hindering him in his work, and became his intimate companion to such purpose, that they began to work in company, and so they continued for a while. This friendship was harmful to Girolamo, not only in the matter of his earnings, but likewise with respect to art, for the reason that he followed in the footsteps of Maestro Biagio, who worked by rule of thumb and took everything from the designs of one master or another, and he also put no more diligence into his pictures. Now, in the monastery of San Michel in Bosco, without Bologna, a certain Fra Antonio, a monk of that convent, had painted a Saint Sebastian of the size of life, besides executing an altarpiece in oils for a convent of the same order of Monte Alavito at Scaracalasino, and some figures in fresco in the chapel of Saint Scolastica in the garden of Monte Alavito Maggiore, 
and Abbot Giacchino, who had compelled him to stay that year in Bologna, desired that he should paint the new sacristy of his church there. But Fra Antonio, who did not feel it in him to do so great a work, and perchance was not very willing to undergo such fatigue, as is often the case with that kind of man, so contrived that the work was allotted to Girolamo and Maestro Biagio, who painted it all in fresco. In the compartments of the vaulting they executed some little boys and angels, and at the head, in large figures, the story of the transfiguration of Christ, availing themselves of the design of that which Raffaello da Urbino painted for San Pietro in Montorio at Rome, and on the other walls they painted some saints, in which, to be sure, there is something of the good. But Girolamo, having recognized that to stay in company with Maestro Biagio was not the course for him, and, indeed, that it was his certain ruin, broke up the partnership when that work was finished, and began to work for himself. The first work that he executed on his own account was an altarpiece for the chapel of San Bastiano in the church of San Salvador in which he acquitted himself very well. But then, having heard of the death of his father, he returned to Ferrara, where for a time he did nothing save some portraits and works of little importance. Meanwhile, Tiziano Vecelli went to Ferrara to execute certain things for Duke Alfonso, as will be related in his life in a little closet or rather study, where Giovanni Bellini had already painted some pictures, and Dosso a Bacchanal rout of men, which was so good that, even if he had never done any other thing, for that alone he would deserve praise and the name of an excellent painter. And Girolamo, by means of Tiziano and others, began to have dealings with the court of the duke and so, as it were to give a proof of his powers before he should do anything else, he copied the head of Duke Ercoli of Ferrara from one by the hand of Tiziano, and counterfeited it so well that it seemed the same as the original, wherefore it was sent as a work worthy of praise into France. Afterwards, having taken a wife and had children by her, Sooner, perchance, than he should have done, Girolamo painted in San Francesco at Ferrara, in the angles of the vaulting, the four evangelists in fresco, which were passing good figures. In the same place he executed a frieze right round the church, which was a very large and abundant work, being full of half-length figures and little boys linked together in a very pleasing manner. And for that church also he painted an altar picture of St. Anthony of Padua with other figures, and another altar piece of Our Lady in the Air with two angels, which was placed on the altar of Signora Giulia Mozzarelli, whose portrait was executed very well therein by Girolamo. At Rovigo, in the church of San Francesco, the same master painted the Holy Spirit appearing in tongues of fire, which was a work worthy of praise for the composition and for the beauty of the heads. At Bologna, for the church of San Martino, he painted an altarpiece of the three magi, with most beautiful heads and figures and at Ferrara, in company with Benvenuto Garofalo, as has been related, the façade of the house of Signor Battista Mozzarelli, and also the palace of Copara, a villa of the dukes, distant twelve miles from Ferrara, and again in Ferrara, the façade of Piero Sansini, in the piazza near the fish market, painting there, the taking of Goleta by the Emperor Charles V. The same Girolamo painted for St. Polo a church of the Carmelite friars in the same city, 
a little altarpiece in oils of St. Jerome, with two other saints of the size of life, and for the duke's palace a great picture with a figure large as life representing opportunity, and executed with beautiful vivacity, movement, and grace, and fine relief. He also painted a nude Venus, life-size and recumbent, with love beside her, which was sent to Paris for King Francis of France. And I, who saw it at Ferrara in the year 1540, can with truth affirm that it was very beautiful. He also made a beginning with the decorations in the refectory of San Giorgio a seat of the monks of Monte Eleveto at Ferrara, and executed a great part of them, but he left the work unfinished, and it has been completed in our own day by Pellegrino Pellegrini, a painter of Bologna. Now, if we were to seek to make particular mention of the pictures that Girolamo executed, for many lords and gentlemen, the story would be longer than is our desire, and I shall speak of two only which are most beautiful. From a picture by the hand of Correggio, that the Chevalier Bayardo has at Parma, beautiful to a marvel, in which Our Lady is putting a shirt on the infant Christ, Girolamo made a copy so like it that it seems the very same picture and he made another copy from one by the hand of Parmigiano, which is in the cell of the vicar in the Certosa at Pavia, doing this so well and with such diligence that there is no miniature to be seen that is wrought with more subtlety, and he executed innumerable others with great care. And since Girolamo delighted in architecture and also gave his attention to it, in addition to many designs of buildings that he made for private persons, he served in that art in particular Cardinal Ippolito of Ferrara, who, having bought the garden at Monte Cavallo in Rome, which had formerly belonged to the Cardinal of Naples, with many vineyards belonging to individuals around it, took Girolamo to Rome, to the end that he might serve him not only in the buildings, but also in the truly regal ornaments of woodwork in that garden. In this he acquitted himself so well that everyone was struck with astonishment, and, indeed, I know not what other man could have done better than he did in executing in woodwork, which has since been covered with most beautiful verdure, works so fine and so pleasingly designed in various forms and in different kinds of temples, in which there may now be seen arranged the richest and most beautiful ancient statues that there are in Rome some whole and some restored by Valerio Scioli, a Florentine sculptor, and by others. By these works Girolamo came into very great credit in Rome, and in the year 1550 he was introduced by the above-named cardinal, his lord, who loved him dearly, into the service of Pope Julius III, who made him architect over the works of the Belvedere giving him rooms in that place and a good salary. But since that pontiff could never be satisfied in such matters, and, to make it worse, was hindered by understanding very little of design, and would not have in the evening a thing that had pleased him in the morning, and also because Girolamo had to be always contending with certain old architects, to whom it seemed strange to see a new man of little reputation preferred to themselves, he resolved, having perceived their envy and possible malignity, and also being rather cold by nature than otherwise, to retire. And so he chose, as the better course, to return to the service of the cardinal at Monte Cavallo, for which action Girolamo was much commended, for it is too wretched a life to have to be always contending all day long, and on every last detail with one person or another, 
and, as he used to say, it is at times better to enjoy peace of mind on bread and water than to sweat and strive amid grandeur and honors. Wherefore, after Girolamo had executed for his lord the cardinal a very beautiful picture, which, when I saw it, pleased me very much, being now weary, he returned with him to Ferrara to enjoy the peace of his home with his wife and children, leaving the hopes and rewards of fortune in the possession of his adversaries, who received from that pope the same as he had done, neither more nor less. While he was living thus at Ferrara, a part of the castle was burned, I know not by what mischance, and Duke Ercole gave the charge of restoring it to Girolamo, who did it very well, adorning it as much as is possible in that district, which suffers from a great dearth of stone wherewith to make carvings and ornaments, for which he well deserved to be always held dear by that lord, who rewarded him liberally for his labors. Finally, after having executed these and many other works, Girolamo died in the year 1556, at the age of fifty-five, and was buried in the church of the Angeli beside his wife. He left two daughters and also three sons, Giulio, Annibale, and another. Girolamo was a blithe spirit, very sweet and pleasing in his conversation, and in his work somewhat slow and dilatory. He was of middle stature, and he delighted beyond measure in music, and more in the pleasures of love than was perhaps expedient. The buildings of his patrons have been carried on since his death by the Ferrarese architect Galasso, a man of the most beautiful genius, and of such judgment in matters of architecture, that, in so far as may be seen from the ordering of his designs, he would have demonstrated his worth much more than he has done, if he had been employed in works of importance. An excellent sculptor, and likewise a Ferrarese, has been Maestro Girolamo, who, living at Recanati, has executed many works in marble at Loreto after his master, Andrea Cantucci, and has made many of the ornaments round that chapel or house of the Madonna. This master, since the departure from that place of Tribolo, who was the last there after he had finished the largest scene in marble, which is at the back of the chapel, wherein are the angels carrying that house from Sclavonia into the forest of Loreto, has labored there continually from 1534 to the year 1560, executing many works. The first of these was a seated figure of a prophet of three brachia and a half, which, being good and beautiful, was placed in a niche that is turned towards the west which statue, having given satisfaction, was the reason that he afterwards made all the other prophets, with the exception of one, that, facing towards the east on the outer side, over against the altar, which is by the hand of Simone Scioli of Settignano, likewise a disciple of Andrea Sansovino. The rest of those prophets, I say, are by the hand of Maestro Girolamo, and are executed with much diligence and study, and good skill of hand. For the chapel of the sacrament, the same master has made the candelabra of bronze, about three brachia in height, covered with foliage, and figures cast in the round, which are so well wrought that they are things to marvel at and a brother of Maestro Girolamo's, who is an able master in similar works of casting, has executed many things in company with him at Rome, and in particular a very large tabernacle of bronze for Pope Paul III, which was to be placed in the chapel that is called the Pauline in the Palace of the Vatican. 
Among the Modenese also there have been at all times craftsmen excellent in our arts, as has been said in other places, and as may be seen from four panel pictures, of which no mention was made in the proper place, because the master was not known. Which pictures were executed in distemper a hundred years ago in that city? and for those times they are painted with diligence and very beautiful the first is on the high altar of san domenico and the others in the chapels that are in the tramezzo of that church and there is living in the same country at the present day a painter called niccolo who in his youth painted many works in fresco about the beccari which have no little beauty and for the high altar of san piero a seat of the black friars in an altar-piece the beheading of saint peter and saint paul imitating in the soldier who is cutting off their heads a similar figure by the hand of antonio da correggio much renowned, which is in San Giovanni Evangelista at Parma. Niccolo has been more excellent in fresco painting than in the other fields of painting, and, in addition to many works that he has executed at Modena and Bologna, I understand that he has painted some very choice pictures in France, where he still lives, under Messer Francesco Primaticcio, abbot of St. Martin, after whose designs Niccolo has painted many works in those parts, as will be related in the life of Primaticcio. Giovanni Battista, also, a rival of that Niccolo, has executed many works in Rome and elsewhere, and in particular he has painted at Perugia in the chapel of Signor Escanio della Cornia in San Francesco many pictures of the life of St. Andrew the Apostle, in which he has acquitted himself very well. In competition with the above-named Niccolo, the Fleming Arrigo, a master of glass windows, has painted in the same place an altarpiece in oils containing the story of the Magi, which would be beautiful enough if it were not somewhat confused and overloaded with colors which conflict with one another and destroy all the gradation. But he has acquitted himself better in a window of glass designed and painted by himself and executed for the chapel of san bernardino in san lorenzo in the same city but to return to giovanni battista having gone back after the above-named works to modena he has executed in the same san piero for which niccolo painted the altar-piece two great scenes at the sides of the actions of st peter and st paul in which he has acquitted himself with no ordinary excellence in the same city of modena there have also been some sculptors worthy to be numbered among the good craftsmen for in addition to modenino of whom mention has been made in another place there has been a master called il modena who has executed most beautiful works in figures of terracotta, of the size of life and even larger, among others those of a chapel in San Domenico at Modena, and for the center of the dormitory of San Piero, a monastery of black friars, likewise in Modena, a Madonna, St. Benedict, Santa Giustina, and another saint. To all these figures he has given so well the color of marble that they appear as if truly of that stone, not to mention that they all have beautiful expressions of countenance, lovely draperies, and admirable proportions. The same master has executed similar figures for the dormitory of San Giovanni Evangelista at Parma, and he has made a good number of figures in the round and of the size of life for many niches on the outer side of san benedetto at mantua in the facade and under the portico which are so fine that they have the appearance of marble
In like manner, Prospero Clemente, a sculptor of Modena, has been, and still is, an able man in his profession, as is evident from the tomb of Bishop Rangone by his hand in the Duomo of Reggio, wherein is a seated statue of that prelate as large as life, with two little boys, all very well executed which tomb he made at the commission of signor ercoli rangone in the duomo of parma likewise in the vaults below there is by the hand of prospero the tomb of the blessed bernardo degli uberti the florentine cardinal and bishop of that city which was finished in the year fifteen forty eight and much extolled Parma also has had at various times many excellent craftsmen and men of fine genius, as has been said above, for besides one Cristofano Castelli, who painted a very beautiful altarpiece for the Duomo in the year 1499, and Francesco Mazzuoli, whose life has been written, there have been many other able men in that city. Mazzuoli, as has been related, executed certain works in the Madonna della Staccata, but left that undertaking unfinished at his death, and Giulio Romano, having made a colored design on paper, which may be seen in that place by everyone, directed that a certain Michelagnolo Anselmi, a Sienese by origin, but a citizen of Parma by adoption, being a good painter, should carry that cartoon into execution, wherein is the coronation of Our Lady. This he did excellently well, in truth, so that he well deserved that there should be allotted to him a great niche, one of four very large niches that are in that temple, opposite to that in which he had executed the above-mentioned work after the design of Giulio whereupon, setting his hand to this, he carried well on towards completion there the adoration of the Magi, with a good number of beautiful figures, making on the flat arch, as was related before in the life of Mazzuoli, the wise virgins and the design of copper rosettes. But when about a third of that work remained for him to do, he died and so it was finished by bernardo soiaro of cremona as we shall relate in a short time by the hand of that michelagnolo is the chapel of the conception in san francesco in the same city and a celestial glory in the chapel of the cross in san pierre martire Girolamo Mazzuoli, the cousin of Francesco, as has been told, continuing the work in that church of the Madonna, left unfinished by his kinsmen, painted an arch with the wise virgins, and adorned it with rosettes. Then, in the recess at the end, opposite to the principal door, he painted the Holy Spirit descending in tongues of fire on the apostles, and in the last of the flat arches, the nativity of Jesus Christ, which, although not yet uncovered, he has shown to us this year of 1566, to our great pleasure, since it is a truly beautiful example of work in fresco. The great central tribune of the same Madonna della Staccata, which is being painted by Bernardo Soiaro, the painter of Cremona, will also be, when finished, a rare work, and able to compare with the others that are in that place. But of all these, it cannot be said that the cause has been any other than Francesco Mazzuoli, who was the first who, with beautiful judgment, began the magnificent ornamentation of that church, which, so it is said, was built after the designs and directions of Bramante. As for the masters of our arts in Mantua, besides what has been said of them up to the time of Giulio Romano, I must say that he sowed the seeds of his art in Mantua, and throughout all Lombardy in such a manner that there have been able men there ever since, 
and his own works are every day more clearly recognized as good and worthy of praise. And although Giovanni Battista Bertano, the principal architect for the buildings of the Duke of Mantua, has constructed in the castle, over the part where there are the waters and the corridor, many apartments that are magnificent and richly adorned with stucco work and pictures, executed for the most part by Fermo Ghisoni, the disciple of Giulio, and by others, as will be related, nevertheless he has not equaled those made by Giulio himself. The same Giovanni Battista has caused Domenico Bruschiosorzi to execute after his design for Santa Barbara, the church of the Duke's castle, an altarpiece in oils truly worthy to be praised, in which is the martyrdom of that saint and, in addition, having studied Vitruvius, he has written and published a work on the Ionic Volute, showing how it should be turned after that author. And, at the principal door of his house at Mantua, he has placed a complete column of stone, and the flat module of another, with all the measurements of that Ionic order marked, and also the palm, inch, foot, and brachio of the ancients, to the end that whoever so desires may be able to see whether those measurements are correct or not. In the church of San Piero, the Duomo of Mantua, which was the work and architecture of the above-named Giulio Romano, since in renovating it he gave it a new and modern form, the same Bertano has caused an altarpiece to be executed for each chapel by the hands of various painters, and two of these he has had painted after his own designs by the above-mentioned Fermo Ghisoni, one for the chapel of Santa Lucia, containing that saint and two children, and the other for that of San Giovanni Evangelista. Another similar picture he caused to be executed by Ippolito Costa of Mantua, in which is Santa Agata with the hands bound and between two soldiers who are cutting and tearing away her breasts. Battista Dagnolo del Moro of Verona painted for the same Duomo, as has been told, the altarpiece that is on the altar of Santa Maria Maddalena, and Girolamo Parmigiano that of Santa Tecla. Paolo Farinato of Verona, Bartano commissioned to execute the altarpiece of San Martino, and the above-named Domenico Bruschiasorzi, that of Santa Margarita, and Giulio Campo of Cremona painted that of San Geronimo, and one that was better than any other, although all are very beautiful, in which is Saint Anthony the Abbot beaten by the devil in the form of a woman who tempts him, is by the hand of Paolo Veronese. But of all the craftsmen of Mantua, that city has never had a more able master in painting than Rinaldo, who was a disciple of Giulio. By his hand is an altarpiece in Santa Agnesi in that city, wherein is Our Lady in the air, with St. Augustine and St. Jerome, which are very good figures, but him death snatched from the world before his time. In a very beautiful antiquarium and study made by Signor Cesare Gonzaga, which is full of ancient statues and heads of marble, that lord has had the genealogical tree of the house of Gonzaga painted in order to adorn it by Fermo Ghisoni, who has acquitted himself very well in everything, and especially in the expressions of the heads. The same Signor César has placed there, in addition, some pictures that are certainly very rare, such as that of the Madonna with the Cat, which Raffaello da Urbino painted, and another wherein Our Lady with marvelous grace is washing the infant Jesus. 
in another little cabinet made for medals, which has been beautifully wrought in ebony and ivory by one Francesco da Volterra, who has no equal in such works. He has some little antique figures in bronze, which could not be more beautiful than they are. In short, between the last time that I saw Mantua and this year of 1566, when I have revisited that city, it has become so much more beautiful and ornate that if I had not seen it for myself, I would not believe it. And what is more, the craftsmen have multiplied there, and they still continue to multiply. Thus, to that Giovanni Battista Montovano, an excellent sculptor and engraver of prints, of whom we have spoken in the life of Giulio Romano, and in that of Marcantonio Bolognese, have been born two sons, who engrave copper plates divinely well, and what is even more astonishing, a daughter called Diana, who also engraves so well that it is a thing to marvel at, and I who saw her, a very gentle and gracious girl, and her works, which are most beautiful, was struck with amazement. Nor will I omit to say that in San Benedetto, a very celebrated monastery of black friars at Mantua, renovated by Giulio Romano after a most beautiful design, are many works executed by the above-named craftsmen of Mantua and other Lombards, in addition to those described in the life of the same Giulio. There are, then, works by Fermo Ghisoni, such as A Nativity of Christ, two altarpieces by Girolamo Mazzuoli, three by Latanzio Gambara of Brescia, and three others by Paolo Veronese, which are the best. In the same place, at the head of the refectory, by the hand of a certain Fra Girolamo, a lay brother of San Dominic, as has been related elsewhere, is a picture in oils which is a copy of the very beautiful Last Supper that Leonardo painted in Santa Maria del Grazie at Milan, and copied so well that I was amazed by it, of which circumstance I make mention again very willingly, having seen Leonardo's original in Milan this year of 1566 reduced to such a condition that there is nothing to be seen but a mass of confusion, wherefore the piety of that good father will always bear testimony in that respect to the genius of Leonardo da Vinci. By the hand of the same monk I have seen in the above-named House of the Mint at Milan a picture copied from one by Leonardo, in which are a woman that is smiling, and St. John the Baptist as a boy counterfeited very well. Cremona, as was said in the life of Lorenzo di Credi and in other places, has had at various times men who have executed in painting works worthy of the highest praise. And we have already related that when Boccaccio Boccaccino was painting the great recess of the Duomo at Cremona and the stories of Our Lady throughout the church, Bonifazio Bembi was also a good painter, and Altobello executed in fresco many stories of Jesus Christ with much more design than have those of Boccaccino. After these works, Altobello painted in fresco a chapel in Sant'Agostino of the same city, in a manner full of beauty and grace, as may be seen by every one. At Milan, in the Corte Vecchia, that is, the courtyard, or rather, piazza of the palace, he painted a standing figure, armed in the ancient fashion much better than any of the others that were executed there by many painters about the same time. After the death of Bonifazio, who left unfinished the above-mentioned stories of Christ in the Duomo of Cremona, Giovanni Antonio Licinio of Pordenone, called in Cremona de Sacchi, finished those stories begun by Bonifazio, 
painting there in fresco five scenes of the Passion of Christ, with a grand manner in the figures, bold coloring and foreshortenings that have vivacity and force, all which things taught the good method of painting to the Cremonese, and not in fresco only, but likewise in oils, for the reason that in the same Duomo, placed against a pilaster in the center of the church, is an altarpiece by the hand of Pordenoni that is very beautiful. Camillo, the son of Boccaccino, afterwards imitated that manner in painting in fresco the principal chapel of San Gismondo without the city, and in other works, and so succeeded much better than his father had done. That Camillo, however, being slow and even dilatory in his work, did not paint much save small things and works of little importance. But he who imitated most the good manners, and who profited most by the competition of the above-named masters, was Bernardo di Gatti, called Il Soyaro, of whom mention has been made in speaking of Parma. Some say that he was of Vercelli, and others of Cremona, but wherever he may have come from, he painted a very beautiful altarpiece for the high altar of San Piero a church of the canons regular, and in their refectory the story of the miracle that Jesus Christ performed with the five loaves and two fishes, satisfying an infinite multitude, although he retouched it so much a secco that it has since lost all its beauty. That master also executed under a vault in San Gismondo, without Cremona, the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, which was a pleasing work and very beautiful in coloring. In the church of Santa Maria de Campania at Piacenza, in competition with Pordenone, and opposite to the St. Augustine that has been mentioned, he painted in fresco a St. George in armor and on horseback, who is killing the serpent with spirit, movement, and excellent relief. That done, he was commissioned to finish the tribune of that church, which Pordenoni had left unfinished wherein he painted in fresco all the life of the Madonna, and although the prophets and sibyls that Pordenoni executed there, with some children, are beautiful to a marvel, nevertheless Soiaro acquitted himself so well that the whole of that work appears as if all by one and the same hand. In like manner, some little altarpieces that he has executed at Vigevano are worthy of considerable praise for their excellence. Finally, after he had betaken himself to Parma to work in the Madonna della Steccata, the great niche and the arch that was left incomplete through the death of Michelagnolo of Siena were finished by the hands of Soyaro and to him, from his having acquitted himself well, the people of Parma have since given the charge of painting the great tribune that is in the center of that church, where he is now constantly occupied in executing in fresco the Assumption of Our Lady, which, it is hoped, is to prove a most admirable work. While Boccaccino was still alive but old, Cremona had another painter called Galeazzo Campo, who painted the rosary of the Madonna in a large chapel in the church of San Domenico, and the façade at the back of San Francesco, with other works and altarpieces by his hand that are in Cremona, all passing good. To him were born three sons, Giulio, Antonio, and Vincenzio. But Giulio, although he learned the first rudiments of art from his father, Galeazzo, nevertheless afterwards followed the manner of Soiaro, as being better, and studied much from some canvases executed in colors at Rome by the hand of Francesco Salviati, which were painted for the weaving of tapestries, and sent to Piazenza to Duke Pier Luigi Farnese. 
The first works that this Giulio executed in his youth at Cremona were four large scenes in the choir of the church of Santa Agata, containing the martyrdom of that virgin, which proved to be such that a well-practiced master might perhaps not have done them so well. Then, after executing some works in Santa Margarita, he painted many facades of palaces in Chioscuro with good design. For the church of San Gismondo, without the city, he painted in oils the altarpiece of the high altar, which was very beautiful on account of the diversity and multitude of the figures that he executed in it in competition with the many painters who had worked in that place before him. After the altarpiece, he painted there many things in fresco on the vaulting, and in particular the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles, who are foreshortened to be seen from below, with beautiful grace and great artistry. At Milan, for the Church of the Passione, a convent of canons regular, he painted a Christ crucified on a panel in oils with some angels, the Madonna, St. John the Evangelist, and the other Maries. In the nunnery of San Paolo, a convent also in Milan, he executed four scenes with the conversion and other acts of that saint. In that work he was assisted by Antonio Campo, his brother, who also painted for the nunnery of Santa Caterina at the Porta Ticinese, likewise in Milan, for a chapel in the new church, the architecture of which is by Lombardino, a picture in oils of St. Helen directing the search for the cross of Christ, which is a passing good work and Vincenzio, likewise, the third of those three brothers. Having learned much from Giulio, as Antonio has also done, is a young man of excellent promise. To the same Giulio Campo have been disciples not only his two above-named brothers, but also Latanzio Gambara and others but most excellent in painting, doing him more honor than any of the rest, has been Sofonisba Anguischiola of Cremona, with her three sisters, which most gifted maidens are the daughters of Signor Amilcari Anguischiola and Signora Bianca Ponzona, both of whom belong to the most noble families in Cremona. Speaking, then, of Signora Sofanispa, of whom we said but little, in the life of Properzia of Bologna, because at that time we knew no more, I must relate that I saw this year in the house of her father at Cremona, in a picture executed with great diligence by her hand, portraits of her three sisters in the act of playing chess, and with them an old woman of the household, all done with such care and such spirit that they have all the appearance of life and are wanting in nothing save speech in another picture may be seen portrayed by the same sofanispa her father signor amilcari who has on one side one of his daughters her sister called minerva who was distinguished in painting and in letters and on the other side, as Drubale, their brother, the son of the same man, and these also are executed so well that they appear to be breathing and absolutely alive. At Piacenza, in the house of the Reverend Archdeacon of the principal church, are two very beautiful pictures by the same hand. In one is the portrait of the Archdeacon, and in the other that of Sovanispa herself, and each of those figures lacks nothing save speech. That lady, having been brought afterwards by the Duke of Alva, as was related above, into the service of the Queen of Spain, in which she still remains at the present day, with a handsome salary and much honor, has executed a number of portraits and pictures that are things to marvel at. 
moved by the fame of which works, Pope Pius the Fourth had Sophonisba informed that he desired to have from her hand the portrait of her Serene Highness the Queen of Spain. Wherefore, having executed it with all the diligence in her power, she sent it to Rome to be presented to him, writing to His Holiness a letter in the precise form given below. Holy Father, from the very reverend nuncio of your holiness, I understand that you desire to have a portrait by my hand of Her Majesty the Queen, my liege lady, and since I accepted this commission as a singular grace and favor, having thus to serve your holiness, I asked leave of Her Majesty, who granted it very willingly, recognizing therein the fatherly affection that your holiness bears to her. Taking the opportunity presented by this chevalier, I send it to you, and if I shall have satisfied therein the desire of your holiness, I shall receive infinite compensation. But I must not omit to tell you that if it were possible in the same way to present with the brush to the eyes of your holiness the beauties of the mind of this most gracious queen you would see the most marvellous thing in all the world but in those parts which can be portrayed by art i have not failed to use all the diligence in my power and knowledge in order to present the truth to your holiness and with this conclusion, in all reverence and humility, I kiss your most holy feet, from the most humble servant of your holiness, Sophonisba Anguiscola, at Madrid, on the 16th of September, 1561. To that letter his holiness answered with that given below, which, having thought the portrait marvelously beautiful, he accompanied with gifts worthy of the great talents of Sovanisba. Pius Papa the Fourth, Dilecta in Christophilia. We have received the portrait of the most gracious queen of Spain, our dearest daughter, which you have sent to us, and it has been most acceptable to us, both on account of the person therein represented, whom we love with the love of a father by reason of her true piety and her other most beautiful qualities of mind, to say nothing of other reasons, and also because it has been very well and diligently executed by your hand. We thank you for it, assuring you that we shall hold it among our dearest possessions, and commending this your art, which, although it is marvellous, we understand to be the least of the many gifts that are in you. And with this conclusion we send you once again our benediction. May our Lord God preserve you. Date Roma, D. 15 October 1561 and let this testimony suffice to prove how great is the talent of Sophonisba. A sister of hers, called Lucia, left at her death fame no less than that of Sophonisba, by means of some pictures by her hand that are no less beautiful and precious than those of her sister described above, as may be seen at Cremona from a portrait that she executed of Signor Pietro Maria, an eminent physician, but even more from another portrait painted by that gifted maiden of the Duke of Sessa, which was counterfeited by her so well that it would seem impossible to do better, or to make a portrait with a more animated likeness. The third of the sisters, Anguisciola, called Europa, is still a child in age. To her, a girl all grace and talent, I have spoken this very year, and in so far as one can see from her works and drawings, she will be in no way inferior to Sophonisba and Lucia, her sisters. This Europa has executed many portraits of gentlemen at Cremona, which are altogether beautiful and natural, and one of her mother, 
Signora Bianca, she sent to Spain, which vastly pleased Sofanispa and every one of that court who saw it. Anna, the fourth sister, although but a little girl, is also giving her attention with much profit to design, so that I know not what to say save that it is necessary to have by nature an inclination for art, and then to add to that study and practice, as has been done by those four noble and gifted sisters, so much enamored of every rare art, and in particular of the matters of design, insomuch that the house of Signor Amilcari and Guischiola, most happy father of a fair and honorable family, appeared to me the home of painting, or rather of all the arts. But, if women know so well how to produce living men, what marvel is it that those who wish are also so well able to create them in painting? But to return to Giulio Campo, of whom I have said that those young women are the disciples, besides other works, a painting on cloth that he has made as a cover for the organ in the cathedral church is executed with much study in distemper, with a great number of figures representing the stories of Esther and Ahasuerus and the crucifixion of Haman. And in the same church there is a graceful altarpiece by his hand on the altar of St. Michael. But since Giulio is still alive, I shall say no more for the present about his works. Of Cremona, likewise, where the sculptor Jeremiah, who was mentioned by us in the life of Filarite, and who has executed a large work in marble in San Lorenzo, a seat of the monks of Monte Alavito, and Giovanni Pedoni, who has done many works at Cremona and Brescia, and in particular many things in the house of Signor Eliseo Raimondo, which are beautiful and worthy of praise. In Brescia also there have been, and still are, persons most excellent in the arts of design, and among others Girolamo Romanino has executed innumerable works in that city. The altarpiece on the high altar of San Francesco, which is a passing good picture, is by his hand, and so also the little shutters that enclose it, which are painted in distemper, both within and without, and his work likewise is another altarpiece executed in oils that is very beautiful, wherein may be seen masterly imitations of natural objects. But more able than that Girolamo was Alessandro Moretto, who painted in fresco under the arch of the Porta Bruschiata the translation of the bodies of saints Faustino and Giovita, with some groups of figures that are accompanying those bodies, all very well done. For San Nazaro, also in Brescia, he executed certain works, and others for San Celso, which are passing good, and an altarpiece for San Piero in Oliveto, which is full of charm. At Milan, in the House of the Mint, there is a picture by the hand of that same Alessandro, with the conversion of St. Paul, and other heads that are very natural, with beautiful adornments of draperies and vestments, for the reason that he much delighted to counterfeit cloth of gold and of silver, velvets, damasks, and other draperies of every kind, which he used to place on the figures with great diligence. The heads by the hand of that master are very lifelike, and hauled to the manner of Raffaello da Urbino, and even more would they hold to it if he had not lived so far from Raffaello. The son-in-law of Alessandro was Latanzio Gambara, a painter of Brescia, who, having learnt his art as has been related under Giulio Campo of Verona, is now the best painter that there is in Brescia. 
by his hand in the black friars church of san faustino are the altarpiece of the high altar and the vaulting and walls painted in fresco with other pictures that are in the same church in the church of san lorenzo also the altarpiece of the high altar is by his hand with two scenes that are on the walls and the vaulting all painted in fresco almost in the same manner he has also painted besides many other facades that of his own house with most beautiful inventions and likewise the interior in which house situated between san benedetto and the vescovado i saw when i was last in brescia two very beautiful portraits by his hand that of alessandro moretto his father-in-law which is a very lovely head of an old man and that of the same alessandro's daughter his wife and if the other works of latanzio were equal to those portraits he would be able to compare with the greatest men of his art but since his works are without number and he himself besides is still living it must suffice for the present to have made mention of those named by the hand of gian girolamo bresciano are many works to be seen in venice and milan and in the above-mentioned house of the mint there are four pictures of night and of fire which are very beautiful in the house of Tommaso d'Ampoli at Venice is a nativity of Christ, a very lovely effect of night, and there are some other similar works of fantasy in which he was a master. But since he occupied himself only with things of that kind and executed no large works, there is nothing more to be said of him save that he was a man of fanciful and inquiring mind and that what he did deserves to be much commended girolamo moschiano of brescia after spending his youth in rome has executed many beautiful works in figures and landscapes and at orvieto in the principal church of santa maria he has painted two altarpieces in oils and some prophets in fresco, which are good works. And the drawings by his hand that are published in engraving are executed with good design. But since he also is alive, serving Cardinal Ippolito d'Este in the buildings and restorations that he is carrying out in Rome, in Tivoli, and in other places, I shall say no more about him at present. There has returned recently from Germany Francesco Ricchino, likewise a painter of Brescia, who, besides many other pictures that he has painted in various places, has executed some works of painting in oils in the above-named San Piero in Alveto at Brescia which are done with much study and diligence the brothers cristofano and stefano painters of brescia have a great name among craftsmen for their facility in drawing in perspective and among other works in venice they have counterfeited in painting on the flat ceiling of santa maria dell'orto a corridor of double-twisted columns similar to those of the Porta Santa in San Pietro at Rome, which, resting on certain great consoles that project outwards, form a superb corridor with groined vaulting right round that church. This work, when seen from the center of the church, displays most beautiful foreshortenings, which fill with astonishment everyone who sees them, and make the ceiling, which is flat, appear to be vaulted. Besides that, it is accompanied by a beautiful variety of moldings, masks, festoons, and other figures, which make a very rich adornment to the work which deserves to be vastly extolled by every one both for its novelty and for its having been carried to completion excellently well and with great diligence 
and since this method gave much satisfaction to that most illustrious senate there was entrusted to the same masters another ceiling similar but small in the library of san marco which for a work of that kind was very highly extolled finally those brothers have been summoned to their native city of brescia to do the same with a magnificent hall which was begun on the piazza many years ago at vast expense and erected over a theatre of large columns under which is a promenade this hall is sixty-two full paces long thirty-five broad and likewise thirty-five in height at the greatest point of its elevation although it appears much larger being isolated on every side and without any apartment or other building about it on the ceiling of this magnificent and most honourable hall then those two brothers have been much employed with very great credit to themselves having made a roof truss for the roof which is covered with lead of beams of wood that are very large composed of pieces well secured with clamps of iron, and having turned the ceiling with beautiful artistry in the manner of a basin-shaped vault, so that it is a rich work. It is true that in that great space there are included only three pictures painted in oils, each of ten braccia, which were painted by the old Tiziano whereas many more could have gone there with a richer more beautiful and better proportioned arrangement of compartments which would have made that hall more cheerful handsome and ornate but in every other part it has been made with much judgment now having spoken in this part of our book up to the present of the craftsmen of design in the cities of lombardy it cannot but be well to say something about those of the city of Milan, the capital of that province, of whom no mention has been made here, although of some of them we have spoken in many other places in this our work. To begin then with Bramantino, of whom mention has been made in the life of Piero della Francesca of the Borgo, I find that he executed many more works than I have enumerated above, and in truth it did not then appear to me possible that a craftsman so renowned who introduced good design into Milan should have executed works so few as those that had come to my notice. Now, after he had painted in Rome, as has been related, some apartments for Pope Nicholas V, and had finished over the door of san sepulcro in milan the christ in foreshortening the madonna who has him on her lap the magdalene and st john which was a very rare work he painted in fresco on a facade in the court of the mint in milan the nativity of christ our saviour and in the church of santa maria di brera in the tramezzo the nativity of our lady with some prophets on the doors of the organ which are foreshortened very well to be seen from below and a perspective view which recedes with a beautiful gradation excellently contrived at which i do not marvel he having always much delighted in the studies of architecture and having had a very good knowledge of them Thus I remember to have seen once, in the hands of Valerio Vicentino, a very beautiful book of antiquities, drawn with all the measurements by the hand of Bramantino, wherein were those of Lombardy and the ground plans of many well-known edifices, which I drew from that book, being then a lad. In it was the temple of Sant'Ambrogio in Milan, built by the Lombards, and all full of sculptures and pictures in the Greek manner, with a round tribune of considerable size, but not well conceived in the matter of architecture, which temple was rebuilt in the time of Bramantino after his design, with a portico of stone on one side, and with columns in the manner of trunks of trees that have been lopped, 
which have in them something of novelty and variety. There, likewise, was drawn the ancient portico of the church of San Lorenzo in the same city, built by the Romans, which is a great work, beautiful and well worthy of note. But the temple there, or rather the church, is in the manner of the Goths. In the same book was drawn the temple of Santa Quilino, which is very ancient and covered with incrustations of marble and stucco, very well preserved, with some large tombs of granite. In like manner, there was the temple of San Piero in Ciel d'Oro at Pavia, in which place is the body of St. Augustine, in a tomb that is in the sacristy, covered with little figures, which, according to my belief, is by the hands of Agostino and Agnolo, the sculptors of Siena. There also was drawn the tower of brick, built by the Goths, which is a beautiful work, for there may be seen in it, besides other things, some figures fashioned of terracotta after the antique, each six braccia high, which have remained in passing good preservation down to the present day. In that tower, so it is said, died Boetius, who was buried in the above-named San Piero in Ciel d'Oro, now called St. Agostino, where there may be seen, even at the present day, the tomb of that holy man, with the inscription placed there by Aleprando, who restored and rebuilt the church in the year 1222. And, besides all these, there was in that book, drawn by the hand of Bramantino himself, the very ancient temple of Santa Maria in Partica, round in shape and built with fragments by the Lombards, in which place now lie the bones from the slaughter of the Frenchmen and others who were routed and slain before Pavia, when King Francis I of France was taken prisoner there by the Emperor Charles V. But let us now leave drawings on one side. Bramantino painted in Milan the façade of the house of Signor Giovanni Battista Latuate with a most beautiful Madonna, and on either side of her a prophet. On the façade of Signor Bernardo Scacalarozzo he painted four giants in imitation of bronze, which are reasonably good. With other works that are in Milan, which brought him credit, from his having been the first light of a good manner of painting that was seen in Milan, and the reason that, after him, Bramante became, on account of the good form that he gave to his buildings and perspective views, an excellent master in the matters of architecture. For the first things that Bramante studied were the works of Bramantino. Under the direction of Bramante was built the temple of San Satiro, which pleases me exceedingly, for it is a very rich work, adorned both within and without with columns, double corridors, and other ornaments, with the accompaniment of a most beautiful sacristy, all full of statues. But above all does the central tribune of that place merit praise, the beauty of which, as has been related in the life of Bramante, was the reason that Bernardino da Trevion followed that method in the Duomo of Milan and gave his attention to architecture, although his first and principal art was painting, having executed, as has been related, in a cloister of the monastery of Santa Maria del Grazi, four scenes of the Passion in fresco, and some others in Chioscuro. By that, Bernardino was brought forward, and much assisted the sculptor Agostino Busto, called Il Bambaja, of whom there has been an account in the life of Bacchio da Montalupo. Agostino executed some works in Santa Marta, a convent of nuns in Milan, among which, although it is difficult to obtain leave to enter that place, I have seen the tomb of Monseigneur de Foix, who died at Pavia, in the form of many pieces of marble, 
wherein are about ten scenes with little figures carved with much diligence of the deeds battles victories and triumphant assaults on strongholds of that lord and finally his death and burial to put it briefly that work is such that i gazing at it in amazement stood for a while marvelling that it was possible for works so delicate and so extraordinary to be done with the hands and with tools of iron for there may be seen in that tomb, executed with the most marvellous carving, decorations of trophies, arms of every kind, chariots, artillery, and many other engines of war, and finally the body of that lord in armour, large as life, and almost seeming to be full of gladness, as he lies dead, at the victories that he had gained. And certainly it is a pity that this work, which is well worthy to be numbered among the most stupendous examples of the art, should be unfinished, and left to lie on the ground in pieces, and not built up in some place. Wherefore I do not marvel that some figures have been stolen from it, and then sold and set up in other places. The truth is that there is so little humanity, or rather piety, to be found among men at the present day, that of all those who were benefited and beloved by de Foix, not one has ever felt a pang for his memory, or for the beauty and excellence of the work. By the hand of the same Agostino Busto are some works in the Duomo, and, as has been related, the tomb of the Baraggi in San Francesco, with many others that are very beautiful in the Sortosa of Pavia. Arrival of Agostino was one Cristofano Gabo, who also executed many works in the façade of the above-named Sortosa and in the church and that so well that he can be numbered among the best sculptors that there were in Lombardy at that time. And the Adam and Eve that are in the east front of the Duomo of Milan, which are by his hand, are held to be rare works, and such as can stand in comparison with any that have been executed by other masters in those parts. Almost at the same time, there lived at Milan another sculptor called Angelo, and by way of surname, Siciliano, who executed on the same side of the Duomo, and of equal size, a Saint Mary Magdalene raised on high by four little angels, which is a very beautiful work, and by no means inferior to those of Cristofano. That sculptor also gave his attention to architecture, and executed, among other works, the portico of St. Celso in Milan, which was finished after his death by Tofano, called Lombardino, who, as was said in the life of Giulio Romano, built many churches and palaces throughout all Milan, and in particular the convent, church, and façade of the nuns of Santa Caterina at the Porta Ticinese, with many other buildings similar to these. Silvio da Fiesoli, laboring at the instance of Tofano in the works of the Duomo, executed in the ornament of a door that faces between the west and the north, wherein are several scenes from the life of Our Lady, the scene containing her espousal, which is very beautiful, and that of equal size opposite to it, in which is the marriage of Cana in Galilee, is by the hand of Marco de Gra, a passing well-practiced sculptor. The work of these scenes is now being continued by a very studious young man called Francesco Brambellari, who has carried one of them almost to completion, a very beautiful work, in which are the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit. He has made also a drop-shaped console of marble, all in open work, with foliage, and a group of children that are marvellous and over that work 
which is to be placed in the Duomo, there is to go a statue in marble of Pope Pius the Fourth, one of the Medici, and a citizen of Milan. If there had been in that place the study of those arts that there is in Rome and in Florence, those able masters would have done, and would still be doing, astonishing things and in truth they are greatly indebted at the present day to the Chevalier Leone Leoni of Arezzo, who, as will be told, has spent much time and money in bringing to Milan casts of many ancient works taken in gesso for his own use and that of the other craftsmen. But to return to the Milanese painters, after Leonardo da Vinci had executed there the Last Supper already described, many sought to imitate him, and these were Marco Ogioni and others, of whom mention has been made in Leonardo's life. In addition to them, Cesare de Sesto, likewise a Milanese, imitated him very well, and besides what has been mentioned in the life of Dosso, he painted a large picture that is in the house of the mint in milan a truly abundant and beautiful work in which is christ being baptized by john by the same hand also in that place is a head of herodias with that of saint john the baptist in a charger executed with most beautiful artistry and finally he painted for San Rocco without the Porta Romana an altarpiece containing that saint as a very young man, with other pictures that are much extolled. Gaudenzio, a Milanese painter, who in his lifetime was held to be an able master, painted the altarpiece of the high altar in San Celso, in a chapel of Santa Maria delle Grazie, he executed in fresco the Passion of Jesus Christ, with figures of the size of life in strange attitudes, and then, in competition with Tiziano, he painted an altarpiece for a place below that chapel, in which, although he was very confident, he did not surpass the works of the others who had labored in that place. Bernardino del Lupino, of whom some mention was made not very far back, painted in Milan near San Sepolcro the house of Signor Gianfrancesco Rabia, that is, the façade, loggi, halls, and apartments, depicting there many of the metamorphoses of Ovid and other fables, with good and beautiful figures, executed with much delicacy and in the Monastero Maggiore he painted all the great altar wall with different stories, and likewise in a chapel Christ scourged at the column, with many other works which are all passing good. And let this be the end of the above-written Lives of Various Lombard Craftsmen. <laughs>